80 years ago, everyone knew the name Howard Hughes. He was a Hollywood filmmaker, an airplane engineer, a wealthy businessman, and a daring pilot. In the 1930s and 40s, newspapers and film screens were filled with tales of his next exciting project. After taking over his father's business, Howard Hughes became a wealthy man with money to spend. He funded expensive movies with dangerous stunts and built machines that only he would dare to build. With each new project, he pushed the boundaries of what was possible. One of these projects would truly test the limits. A massive boat plane built mostly of wood. Many people know this plane by the name the Spruce Goose, but Hughes called it H-4 Hercules. This is the story of Howard Hughes and the giant flying boat. historians, welcome to another episode of Anytime Now. I'm Brooke, co-founder of Honest History. Do you love building things or learning about machines? Or maybe you like watching movies or airplanes? If you said yes to any of these, then you're in for a special treat in this episode. As you listen to the story, try to imagine yourself in Howard Hughes's shoes. Would you do anything differently? Maybe instead of flying planes, you'd build the fastest boat or the fastest car. Whatever you decide, there is a lot to be learned from the perseverance and hard work that Hughes dedicated his life to. Now, let's get back to the story. Our story begins in 1920 in Connecticut. 14-year-old Howard Hughes was standing on the shore of the Thames River. Crowds of people cheered around him as they all watched two rowing boats race past. It was the Harvard-Yale Boat Race, a race that happens once a year between Harvard University and Yale University. Hughes' father had gone to Harvard briefly and thought it would be fun to bring his son to watch the race. After battling for position, Harvard's boat glided past the finish line, six lengths ahead of Yale. Hughes' father clapped his hands excitedly, thrilled that his school took first place. Suddenly, Hughes heard a rumbling sound and looked up into the sky. He saw a Curtis flying boat soaring above him and watched it land on the river. Hughes' father looked over at his son and pointed at the plane. Want to take a ride? He asked, still beaming after Harvard's victory. As it turned out, you could ride in the plane for $5. His father handed over $5 and Hughes stepped aboard the plane. With the engine rumbling, the pilot pushed the throttle lever forward to accelerate the plane. In no time at all, Hughes was out of the water and up in the sky. He could feel the wind blowing through his hair as he gazed at the river below. This is the first time Hughes had ever flown in a plane, and it would not be his last. From that day on, Howard Hughes would dream of flying. He wanted to be an aviation pioneer. Fast forward seven years, and Hughes was now a young man. He had taken over his father's successful tool-making business, and he was able to use the money to create his heart's desire. At first, he decided to move to Hollywood to make movies. Hughes' first three movies did not do very well. In fact, you could call them flops. but his next film was going to be a hit. And it was about something Hughes loved, airplanes. It was a movie about two British pilots who flew during World War I. To make the movie, Hughes used 34 real airplanes and even got a pilot's license to fly all of them. As the story goes, Hughes didn't want to ask his actors to do anything he couldn't do. So that meant if his actors needed to fly, then he needed to fly too. One day on set, Hughes was showing a pilot how to do a stunt. Then something went terribly wrong. Hughes soared up into the sky, then took a sharp left right after takeoff. The pilot immediately crashed. Hughes recovered, but bumped his head pretty badly. 
Some say he was never quite the same after the crash. Hughes didn't let his accident slow him down. He decided to focus all of his attention on airplanes and created a company called Hughes Aircraft Company. And then, quite strangely, he disappeared for months. That's what people thought. Actually, Hughes secretly got a job with American Airlines as a baggage handler. That's right. The famous Howard Hughes was unloading passengers' bags. Of course, no one knew it was Hughes because he used a fake name. Everyone on American Airlines called him Charles Howard. It wasn't long before Hughes moved up in the ranks at American Airlines. Soon he was flying co-pilot on a plane traveling from Texas to Ohio. And he continued to fly until his real identity was finally found out. By now, Hughes realized something. He didn't just want to fly airplanes, he wanted to build them. And he wanted to build planes that were better and faster than ever before. So that's exactly what he started to do. One thing you should know about Howard Hughes, once he had an idea, it was nearly impossible to change his mind. And he wanted everything to be perfect. Hughes designed his own aircraft and had his new company, Hughes Aircraft Company, build it, with the help of an engineer named Glenn Odekirk. The two men were able to create a record-breaking plane. Hughes called it the H-1 Racer, and it was fast. In 1935, Hughes climbed into the racer, pulled down the goggles, and started the engine. The racer rocketed to a speed of 352 miles per hour, the fastest by any land plane ever flown. But there was a problem. Hughes didn't have enough fuel to get back safely on the ground. As the plane's engine sputtered to a stop, Hughes aimed for a beet field in the distance. Within seconds, he had crash-landed in the field. Thankfully, he was unharmed. When people arrived at the scene, Hughes was already planning his next flight. We can fix her, he said. She'll go faster. In 1937, Hughes flew from California to New Jersey in the fastest time, seven hours and 28 minutes. The New York Times reported this astounding achievement. When an amateur pilot in the space of a few months could break the world land plane speed record and go up half an hour off the transcontinental record, he is a pilot to be reckoned with. But while Howard Hughes was spending money building his wildest dreams, the rest of the country was struggling. The American people were living through a period called the Great Depression. It was a time when many families had a hard time finding jobs and making money. Tales of Hughes's lavish movies and daring flights felt like another world to everyday Americans. In 1938, Hughes geared up for his most incredible feat yet, the record-breaking flight around the world. Hughes and four of his companions set off from New York to circle the globe. Three days later, he arrived back in New York to crowds of people cheering his name. Hughes had flown around the world faster than anyone else. While Howard Hughes celebrated, there was some troubling news from Europe. A war was brewing across the Atlantic. The next year, Howard Hughes opened the newspaper to read a shocking headline. World War II had begun. Airplanes weren't for just breaking records or daring stunts. They were being used in battle. Two years later, the U.S. entered the war. And Howard Hughes' factories would be building planes for the battlefront. During the first few months of the war, the U.S. experienced many losses. Hidden beneath the ocean, submarines patrolled the waters, armed with deadly torpedoes. In just six months, the Germans had sunk over 600 ships. The U.S. needed a way to transport troops out of the water, above the submarines. A shipbuilder named Henry Kaiser came up with a crazy idea. What about a giant boat plane? A plane that could land in the water and carry over 700 troops across the Atlantic. No one had ever built such a massive plane before. Would such a machine even be able to fly? There was only one way to find out, and that was to build it. Kaiser didn't know much about airplanes, but he knew a man who did. In 1942, he called Howard Hughes. After getting money from the U.S. government, Kaiser and Hughes began the most ambitious project yet. If it worked, it could be the largest plane ever constructed. And there was something else. 
Metal was precious during the war, so the plane had to be made almost entirely of wood. Hughes called the flying wooden boat the H-4 Hercules, but most people came to know it as Spruce Goose. Hi, young historians. Time for a quick break from this amazing story to tell you a bit more about honest history. If you're enjoying this episode, then you'll love Honest History's magazines and books. Each one is filled with important adventures through the past, like the story of Cheng Yi Sao, a Chinese woman who commanded one of the largest pirate fleets in history, to Mansa Musa from Africa, one of the wealthiest people to ever live. You can pick up a copy or subscribe and receive three issues delivered straight to your doorstep every three months. Just go to honesthistory.co and use code anytime now for a 10% discount. That's honesthistory.co and special promo code anytime now. Okay, let's get back to the story. For years, Hughes worked to get his giant plane off the ground. Countless hours were spent shaping, carving, tweaking each component, making sure that each rivet, joint, and seam was perfect. It was awfully hard to build a ship this big out of wood, Hughes said. None had ever been built before, even dreamed of in a size as much as one-tenth of this. As it turned out, the war had ended before the plane was finished. And the U.S. government wasn't very happy with how much money Hughes spent to construct the machine he couldn't even fly. Mm. But Hughes didn't want to give up. I do not know anyone who could have worked harder than I did, Hughes said. He needed to prove to everyone, including himself, that Hercules wasn't a failure. He needed to prove he could fly. I put the sweat of my life into this thing. I have my reputation rolled up in it. And I have stated several times that if it's a failure, I'll probably leave this country and never come back, and I mean it. In October of 1947, Hughes announced that he would be testing the giant flying boat. Standing tall in Long Beach, California, the Hercules was a sight to behold. Its tail alone was as high as an eight-story building. To put it simply, it was enormous. On November 2nd, thousands of people gathered on the shore to watch Hercules in action. Hughes sat inside, behind the controls, as the plane was pulled into the ocean. With the engine roaring, Hughes piloted the plane smoothly on top of the water. So far, it could float, but could it fly? The wind blew strongly as the Hercules began to accelerate over the water. On board, there was Hughes, his crew, and a journalist who was covering the entire trip over the radio. This is James McNamara speaking to you from aboard the Howard Hughes 2,000 ton flying boat. We have eight powerful engines on either side of us as the boat begins to rock perceptibly now for the first time as we get into a roll here in the outer harbor. Now we're plowing along. Hughes was checking all of the controls inside the hull when he turned to one of the crew members. Lower 15 degrees of flaps, Hughes ordered. The flaps at the end of the wings were lowered and Hughes pushed the throttle levers forward. The water slapped against the sides of the giant boat as it picked up speed. The journalist looked at the plane's speedometer and watched it quickly increase. It's 50 knots, he shouted. It's 50 over a choppy sea. It's 55. It's 55. More throttle. It's 60. It bounces to 65. It's 70. It's 75. And something momentarily he cut out, and I believe we are airborne. Suddenly the plane lifted off the water and flew for about a mile. We are airborne, ladies and gentlemen, and I don't believe that Howard Hughes meant this to be. I don't know. We were airborne for just a moment, and we were really up in the air. We were really up in the air. <laughs> and I don't know whether Howard, Howard, did you expect that? Certainly, I like to make surprises. You were surprised or not? Oh, I said I thought I'd make a surprise. Although it had been a very short flight, the Hercules had done it. It had taken to the skies. 
Hughes had hoped to test the Hercules again, but that was the last time it would ever fly. Months later, the plane was hidden away in a hangar in California. It would not be seen again for many years. The Hercules didn't turn out as Hughes had hoped. It had never been used during the war and it flew for less than a minute. But this plane tells a lot about the man who built it, daring and expensive. The Hercules was something only Howard Hughes would try to build. It pushed the boundaries of what was possible. Today, the Hercules rests in the Evergreen Aviation and Space Museum in Oregon, while visitors can see the giant aircraft with their own eyes. Although people have built bigger planes since, the Hercules is still the largest boat plane ever constructed. It is an important reminder of the man who created it, a man who dared to dream beyond the limits of the sky. Welcome back. What did you think of the story? Even though the Hercules was never used for its intended purposes, many great lessons were learned in the process. It's a great reminder that even when the outcome isn't what we thought it would be, the steps we take to get there can be just as important as the end result. In fact, many great people from history failed at things, but they still made history by persevering and learning from their mistakes. That's all for now. But if you want to learn more about great inventors and inventions, check out Honest History's book, History is Inventive. You'll learn all about the stories behind famous inventions. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next time. This episode was hosted by Jeff Richards and written by Heidi Coburn. Production was led by Randall Lawrence and Robot Pirate Media. To learn more about this episode, including more about the host, visit us at honesthistory.co and follow along for updates on social media at Honest History. When you think about history, are there lots of old guys wearing wigs and stockings? When you think about history, is Napoleon really short? And folks have wooden teeth. Do you know that history can be the most incredible, amazing stories for you and me? Sit back and listen to a story right now. It's on it.